I will call the remote hearing of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance Division to order. Today is April 24th, 2020. This meeting is held in accordance with Rule 10.01, which was passed and allows for remote hearings. All remote hearings are recorded and live streamed by House Public Information. I am State Representative Rick Hansen, and I have the privilege of chairing the House Environment and Natural Resources Finance Division this biennium. Members, just a few guidelines. As with any com committee hearing, all committee discussion will continue to go through the chair. If you want to be recognized, please use the raise your hand button on your participants panel. For members on the phone, please use nine, star nine, and that should activate a raise your hand symbol. And members realize those that are on the phone, it may take a moment uh, for their uh, voice uh, to connect into the Zoom meeting. If you are not getting called on, please send an email to committee administrator Pete Strohmeyer from your house account. Please mute yourself so we can reduce any background noise and maintain the quality of the presentation. All voting will be done by roll call taken by the committee legislative assistant. I should note that the minutes do not have to be done by roll call. They can be done by voice vote. Please try to limit the noise in your workspace during the roll calls. Members are expected to unmute themselves when voting and when called on by the chair. The CA and the CLA may mute members if their mute is left off and there is background noise. The clerk will take the attendance by roll. Clay? Representative Hansen. Here. Representative Claflin. Here. Representative Fabian. Here. Uh, Representative Tice may be a little late, just an FYI. Thank you. Representative Backer. He's checking in on the phone too. Okay, is he not on yet? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, he's not on yet, no. I'll come back to him. I'll double check, uh, yep. He said he's on hold. Wait, proceed. Representative Becker Finn. Here. Representative Eklund. Here. Representative Fisher. Here. Representative Green. Representative Heinzman. Here. Representative Lee. Present. Representative Lewick. Representative Morrison. Present. Representative Nelson. Representative Purcell. Representative Sandell. Representative Sandell. Present. Oh, sorry. Representative Sundin. Representative Sundin. Here. Representative Tice will be here shortly. Representative Wogenius. Present. Representative Backer. Representative Green. Representative Lewick. Present. Representative Nelson. Present. Representative Purcell. Fourteen members present. 
Quorum is present. Mr. Chair. Representative Fabian. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Backer says that we, we shouldn't be seeing him now. I don't know what's going on with the technology here. Yep, Mr. Chair is- um, Mr. Strohmeyer. Is uh, uh, 320-695-2901. Is that Representative Backer? Yes. Okay, thank you. He is on the, I'm seeing he's on. Okay, and I believe Representative Green just joined us. Okay. So, Mr. Chair, are you going to mark them present, please? Yes. Yes, I have marked them present. <laughs> are we missing anyone? Um, Representative yeah. Purcell. Oh, he's here. Chair Hanson. Yes. Representative yeah, Purcell. Yes, this is, this, is, this is Purcell. I'm on. So, just Representative Tice, then. Forum is present. The next item on the agenda are the minutes for Tuesday, April 21st, 2020. Uh, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, I have reviewed those minutes and I would move the minutes, uh, Mr. Chair. Representative Becker Finn moves the minutes for April 21st, 2020. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The minutes are approved. Next item of business, I will move that House File 3657 be recommended uh, to be re referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Members, this is the DNR policy bill. I have Mr. Meyer, Bob Meyer here for questions on the bill. I'd also like to note that we have various DNR staff on the call to answer questions that may arise today. Ms. Linda Glazer from the Board of Animal Health is also available to answer any questions on the A7 amendment, and Mr. Tony Quillis is on the call to testify on the A7 amendment. Members, the bill has been posted. It went through the policy committee uh, and resides in our committee. Are there any questions on the bill? Seeing none, uh, Representative Becker Finn, I believe you have the A7 amendment. Yes, I would move the A7 amendment, Mr. Chair. Representative Becker Finn moves the A7 amendment. Representative Becker Finn, would you please speak to your amendment? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I'll just note at the forefront that uh, obviously the way that we would have um, done our amendments would be a little bit different if we weren't uh, legislating during a pandemic. Uh, so this is sort of this this amendment has a, a couple different things in it. I'll, I will walk through those pretty quickly, and then I know that uh, staff is available. Uh, to answer questions as well as um, members of our committee who are authors of some of the, the language uh, originally that is now uh, included in this amendment. Uh, so first included in this amendment is House File 4331, which was originally uh, Chair Hansen's bill and it uh, regards escaped farmed survey and um, essentially allows you know, if a hunter comes across a farm cervid while they're hunting and shoots that deer, it, it holds them harmless and then requires that the owner of that deer uh, would have to have it tested for CWD at the owner's, uh, the owner's expense. Uh, also included is House File 3819, which was Representative Liz Lagarde's bill that uh, was heard in environment policy and approved unanimously regarding uh, ATV uh, tire inflation. Uh, then uh, House File 3703, which was Representative Marquardt's bill, also heard in environment policy previously um, regarding allowing in, in, in a maximum amount of compensation for soil and water conservation district supervisors from $75 to $125. That hasn't been raised in quite some time. Um, also included is House File 4433, which was uh, Representative Wagenius's bill regarding water use permits. Uh, House File 3180, which was uh, Representative Claflin's bill, which was also heard in both environment policy, commerce, and environment finance previously regarding um, PFAS chemicals in food packaging. Um, other uh, provisions in the amendment are uh, carry forward extensions to allow uh, no child left inside in the Emerald Ash Borer Response Grant Program, uh, just extensions since things have kind of been put on hold right now for everybody. Um, there's also some language regarding uh, better accessibility uh, 
for folks on uh, WMAs. And this language was um, discussed in environment policy and also included in the Outdoor Heritage Fund bill that uh, passed out of the Legacy Committee. Um, and essentially it's requiring the DNR to work with the Council on Disability to make sure folks have better access uh, to WMAs. And then finally, there's a uh, House File 251, which was representative of Eklund's bill that was heard last year um, regarding uh, Lake Vermilion and Sudan uh, Mine State Park. Uh, so those are the provisions that are included in the amendment. Uh, vast majority of the language is things that have already been out there and uh, have passed out of uh, other committees. And happy to take questions, but I know there's a couple uh, testifiers as well. I'd like to move to the testifiers to make sure they are able to get on the record. Uh, Mr. Meyer. Mr. Chairman, members of the record, Bob Meyer, Department of Natural Resources. Uh, we'd like to thank you for the inclusion of many of our policy provisions that we've been working with you on this session and this amendment and the, the rest of our bill as well. So I can answer any specific questions if members have them on any in individual sections. Members, do you have any questions for Commissioner Meyer? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Representative Lewick. Representative Heisman, I'm going to go with Representative Lewick first because he's on uh, phone, I believe, and then I'll go to you. So I'd like to go with Representative Lewick. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, several questions relative to the chronic wasting disease element of this uh, uh, amendment. Uh, one, uh, how would the DNR handle the licensing being as how we do a certain amount of uh, zone-based uh, hunting? We've got different seasons that uh, uh, some are shorter, some are longer. Uh, what kind of licenses would the DNR be issuing uh, since in order to carry out this uh, uh, hunting of uh, escaped uh, Cervidae farm deer, uh, first thing is uh, we have to be a licensed hunter. How, how does the DNR plan to do that? Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Meyer. Uh, Colonel Rodman Smith to, to help us answer those questions, please. I know he's available here. Mr. Colonel Smith, if you could uh, state your name uh, for the record. Colonel Rodman Smith, uh, Director of Enforcement, Department of Natural Resources. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Lewick, my understanding uh, about uh, a licensed hunter would be, uh, I think you're looking at line 1.17, 1.19. Um, it would be a licensed hunter under Chapter 97A, so it would be under an existing season framework. So we wouldn't be issuing special licenses for individuals to go shoot uh, escape cervid, it would be in relation to an already established season. And so if we have hunters out um, in the area and they see a deer that has a tag on, an ear tag on it uh, while they're hunting normally, uh, they'd be able to take that, that escape cervid at that time. So we would not be issuing any escape cervid uh, special licenses or having special seasons. Representative Becker Finn to the question. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And that that is the intent. There wouldn't be some special kind of season to to go after escaped deer. Um, the idea being we've had examples in the past where we've had um, hunters who are legally licensed hunters out um, and there have been escaped uh, deer that were previously captive, um, at facilities. And then there've been some issues about, uh, whether they could legally take those deer. And, um, there was even an example, uh, last season where there was one of those sort of mutant bucks that someone took during the archery season. And then, um, you know, the person who had it escaped from their facility and didn't retrieve it was then upset with the hunter who was um, licensed to do, you know, what hunters do. So um, that's that's the intent is just to make sure that our hunters aren't going to be put at further liability um, when it's not their fault that we've got escaped, you know, potentially diseased uh, deer um, running around in the environment. Um, and I know to the the fiscal note that we have um, was. It's, the language is a little bit different than the language that's in um, 
in this amendment, but the fiscal note from the underlying bill uh, noted that uh, reported escapes from the state's 10,600 registered farm cervids um, number approximately 100 animals per year, and then um, currently went on to say that the current escalating trend in escaped cervids and CWD incidents will continue into the future for at least the next several years. Um, and so that that's what we're trying to deal with and um, making sure that, you know, outside the fence, um, we've we've got some different rules and that uh, that's how, how it should be um, as we, we deal with a species that is, you know, one of the really the only species that is uh, both farmed with livestock and also a protected uh, natural resource in our state. Representative Lewick. Uh, follow up uh, with uh, uh, Commissioner, Assistant Commissioner Meyer. Um, is there concern that this uh, could touch off kind of a vigilante approach uh, in some areas? Uh, this uh, like a uh, you know, no no consideration for uh, trying to uh, get the deer back. Uh, it basically wipes out a bunch of stuff that. Uh, uh, it certainly puts the onus on the, uh, the deer farmer, uh, but uh, uh, any any concern about this uh, uh, being the kind of thing that some un uh, you know some folks may take advantage of and turn into sort of a vigilante approach? There's a quite a bit of that about that in the uh, in some uh, areas uh, toward anybody farming uh, survey day right now. Let's do away with them. Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, members, uh, Representative Lewick, this language right now isn't too far off from current law. And I can, again, I'll defer to, to Colonel Smith, but currently after a deer has escaped, I believe it's after 24 hours, but I'm not quite sure, a person is able to harvest that animal if it's escaped. So um, Mr. Chair, if we could again, go to Colonel Smith for clarification on that current situation. Colonel Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, there, there, uh, Commissioner Meyer is correct. Um, after 24 hours, um, the escaped animal could be dispatched or, or um, <coughs> put down by folks. And so this isn't really much of a change. Um, you know, it is uh, escaped uh, cervid, so it's not a wild animal. And so um, we have had some instances where a uh, hunter has harvested uh, an escaped cervid, and um, we don't get in the middle of that. That gets to be more of a civil issue between the hunter and and the producer. And so, um, this language is not too far off from what's what's kind of currently going on. Just gives it much more clarification. Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for that answer. Well, and then that begs a question. Uh, does the DNR feel this is absolutely something they have to have uh, if uh, the language is so similar and provides for uh, taking a uh, appropriate approach right now? Is this something that is just uh, that we should be doing in the middle of a COVID uh, uh, emergency, trying to legislate on uh, this kind of wordsmithing? Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, members, Representative Luke, while I understand your concern, on the COVID front, the disease that we're fighting within the wild deer population and in the farm cervids is, is a serious issue as well. I think clarifying this for the hunters out there and also making sure that producers realize that if their animals are escaped, they are, um, you know, for lack of a better term, fair game. So it will help the producers understand how important it is to avoid an escape and also clarify for people out in the field that this is uh, an animal that should be taken down. Okay, Lewick, anything else? Uh, yes, a little more follow-up. I appreciate uh, Assistant Commissioner uh, Meyer's comments, but uh, I can assure you that the uh, survey day farmers uh, do understand the importance of uh, an escaped animal. Uh, and I don't think we need this type of language to remind them of that. I'd like to go on though to uh, an issue here uh, and maybe the Department of <clears throat> the Board of Animal Health may have better be able to answer this. Um, do we believe it's possible to uh, view a phone number, address, uh, and uh, maybe the owner's uh, name 
on an ear tag and an animal the size of a deer at 50 yards. Uh, that's uh, 2.5 through lines 2.7. Uh, or incorporate global positioning system apparently into the deer ear or underneath their skin. I just, uh, that's new technology as far as I can see. But, uh, and again, Board of Animal Health is probably appropriate to answer that. They're very familiar with tagging. Dr. Glazer. Uh, Mr. Chair and representatives, this is Linda Glazer, Assistant Director with the Board of Animal Health. <clears throat> our um, statutory and requirements also reiterated in our rule indicate um, that all farm servants have to be identified with official identification. And that means an identification that is unique to that animal within uh, into livestock within the United States. So um, that's required as well as it, uh, for an identification to be visible at 50 yards. <clears throat> Typically, um, with a, a bangle or plastic ear tag, um, that that is uh, that can be done, other than you know under cover of, of heavy vegetation, certainly. As one who's very familiar with uh, that type of an ear tag in uh, uh, livestock, it's quite a bit bigger than an average deer. Uh, those are prone to uh, frequent loss, uh, even in. Uh, fairly open pastures and obviously deer would uh, approach uh, uh, cover and that type of thing in a different manner than a uh, livestock uh, uh, cattle, for example, uh, would approach. So, uh, and this business about uh, a global positioning system technology, do we have uh, that type of stuff that's in common use uh, amongst producers right now? Uh, with uh, animals that uh, the Board of Animal Health is involved with? Dr. Glazer. Mr. Chair and uh, representatives, uh, in regards to the question for GPS, no, there is no current um, identification uh, available that would incorporate um, GPS um, location um, into uh, that technology into an ear tag. Um, and also you are correct that um, certainly uh, farm servants along with other livestock um, keeping tags in the ear uh, can be problematic and so we are continually working with producers to um, you know they have to keep their animals tagged if they lose tags they have to re-tag them they have to connect the old identification to the new one so we can continue to identify that individual animal. But that is something uh, that certainly um, happens and we continue to, uh, you know, the producers have to continue to work on that on an ongoing basis to keep the animal identified. We encourage uh, two forms of identification uh, in animals uh, and partially for that reason. If you lose one tag, you'd have another one left in the air that could um, serve as uh, a backup identification. Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just uh, kind of summarize here. Uh, again, we're in the middle of a, a pretty serious emergency. We're trying to legislate uh, stuff that at this point, uh, at, at best, is really, I think, frankly, unnecessary. Uh, uh, and particularly since this bill is now apparently headed for ways and means, you're going to play with animal tags of any kind that should be going back through the, the uh, Agriculture Finance and Policy uh, Committee uh, uh, for starters. And, and again, uh, I just see this as unnecessary and taking advantage of an emergency situation uh, and uh, just out of character with uh, what I understood uh, we should be doing here. Uh, and that's focused on, uh, uh, you know, immediate emer uh, emergency situation. So I, I've, uh, a little frustrated that we're even dealing with this uh, portion of the amendment. Uh, I've heard the comment in the dark and night more than once uh, on the House floor. And uh, I'm unfortunately uh, uh, afraid that we're doing this and uh, uh, over the telephone and the internet line uh, and not out there uh, where we could get really full public discourse uh, on the ramifications of continuing to tinker with something that doesn't need to be fixed. Thank you. 
Representative Becker Finn, the author of the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, first to the comment of the idea that we're somehow taking advantage of, of an emergency situation, we still need to do our jobs. And um, there are all kinds of things where many hours in the day and, uh, you know, addressing CWD, it, <laughs> um, I mean, it's deer really, cervids are the only other species dealing with a very serious um, outbreak of a disease in our state right now, other than humans. And um, I actually think the public is paying even more attention to how we deal with outbreaks of disease right now. Um, and so there's, there's no um, taking advantage of anything. And in some ways, I actually think um, by doing these hearings um, with the ability for people to call in from different locations, in some ways, there's actually more ways for members of the public to participate in these hearings now than when we require folks to come all the way down to St. Paul and pay for parking and wait around all day to participate in our hearings. So um, the idea that this is somehow uh, some nefarious way of hiding things from the public is um, it, that that's not what's going on here at all. Uh, we're live streamed right now. This is going to be recorded. Um, there is plenty of time uh, for this process to happen. And and that that's what's going on here. As far as the um, the comments about tagging, um, I, I, this is actually interesting. This is the first time we've kind of we've talked about this frequent loss um, of tags, and so that's why we need to look at different mechanisms of keeping track of these animals. Um, you know, just a quick Google search while uh, representative the representative was talking. Um, there's all kinds of RFID tags and different tags. I know um, my my own pet dogs um, are microchipped, and there's the ability uh, to keep track of things that way. So um, the technology's out there. Um, it's just a matter of um, wanting to keep it up to date. And I. Um, I do think, you know, to get back to what the, you know, I know we have uh, a couple testifiers or one other testifier, but um, as the DNR said, this isn't um, too much far off from what we're doing right now, but I think that our um, hunters do deserve to have some clarity here to make sure that they're not dealing with, as uh, Colonel Smith talked about, this sort of civil issue when, you know, they haven't done anything wrong. They're not the ones not tracking their escaped animals. Um, you know, and, and frankly, if folks who are breeding these animals truly understand how important this is, I don't know why we have hundreds of escapes and we continue to have um, this be an ongoing issue. Uh, so clearly it, it is important. This is another uh, infectious disease that we're dealing with. And I think it's um, important that we deal with it now and not just put it off because it's not directly related to COVID-19. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make just a brief response to one thing that was said. Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate uh, Representative Becker Finn's uh, comments. I would like to point out, though, as one who has uh, watched for almost 20 years trying to do RFID uh, uh, tagging and uh, with livestock, uh, that RFID tag, that insert under the skin that she referred to with her pet, uh, you have to have a wand to read that, and you have to be very close to it. Uh, so let's be cautious and understand that uh, the little implant you put in your pet uh, is uh, very unique, and uh, one doesn't give you a locator disc uh, identification, and you have to have a wand literally within inches to a foot or two to even be able to find it. So please don't uh, anybody misunderstand uh, uh, what kind of tag that is. Thank you. Representative Heinzman, and then Representative Fabian, then Representative Green, and then Representative Sandell. Representative Thank Heinzman. You, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe uh, Commissioner, My Commissioner Meyer is still here, and we were allowed to ask him a few questions. So the one number one question that I wanted to, to hear from him right away on was, uh, if, is, is this an agency priority? Is this something that DNR is asking for? Is this your language or, or is this something that uh, is different? Mr. Commissioner Chair, Meyer. Mr. Chairman, members, I believe uh, Representative Becker Finn had the house file number that was referred to this section. This was not an agency bill, one that we were working with the author on to address concerns. 
Representative Hainsman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then um, I thought I heard the Board of Animal Health folks were on the line, and I'm not sure if I heard that correctly. Is that is that the case? Yeah, I see you nodding. Okay. Um, the other question I had then was, um, are we are we doing something very unique, or are there other examples of this kind of uh, um, language being out there? I'm thinking of an example like uh, if, say, we had an outbreak of bovine tuberculosis. Um, is there a sort of a shoot to kill order out there for cows that may be suspected of having escaped during a uh, outbreak of, of some other kind of disease? Or is there an example of this anywhere else in the agriculture world? Dr. Glazer. Uh, Mr. Chair and representatives, uh, as far as our other livestock programs, um, there, you know, your phrase of is there was is there a shoot to kill order? Uh, no, not um, not that I'm aware of. Um, certainly, um, other animals, uh, if they're diseased, we we do quarantine those animals. They are not allowed to move freely, um, except you know with perhaps permit from the board. So there's that sort of enforcement that's placed for any animals we either suspect or confirmed with disease. Representative uh, Follow up, thank you, Mr. Chair, on that with the board. Um, do you have the numbers, Dr. Glazer, of um, escaped animals, let's say in 2019, just to give folks an idea of the scope of this, of this problem as it's being um, discussed here today? Dr. Glazer. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representatives, um, yes, yes, I do. Um, we, I've uh, tallied uh, escapes we've had uh, since I took over the a program, and we have um, numbers of animals as well as the events. So um, we um, had an event can have more than one animal escape, and then we track um, whether the animals are returned and whether they're killed, and ultimately how many animals are lost. Actually, um, 2019, the, that state fiscal year is, is how we reported that information. And 2019 was an exceptionally high year, and, what, and we had 99 animals escape. And when I looked at that, we, have, we had three cases of vandalism in farm servant um, herds where uh, the locks were cut or gates were removed from hinges, and 42 of those 99 animals could, were related directly to those three acts of vandalism. So, um, you know, not, that was that was an unusually high number. In the previous years, we've had um, uh, a couple of years with, with 60 animals escaped. And um, I, can, I can go to the um, data that I have on that. Typically, we get um, 75 to 90% of those animals either are returned or killed. And then um, some of those are, are lost. Uh, in other words, we don't recover them and they're not returned to the pen or harvested. Uh, thank, you. thank you for that, Dr. Glazer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, my next question, I guess, would be for uh, Representative Jamie Becker. So um, I'm wondering, this language that you have here in front of us today, Representative Becker Finn, is it, is this like is this something that we've been working with stakeholders? Did they give you any feedback on this? Any other solutions or options that might avoid the the scenario that we're looking at here in the language that immediately after a deer may potentially have, for example, in the case of a fence being vandalized and uh, no fault of, fault of their own, their 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 livestock being immediately shot by. Uh, a potentially a hunter, or who knows what the other scenarios might be. Is there any sort of compromise or solutions that they might have presented to you? Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my focus is on good policy and on actual hunters. Um, I'm not really interested in sort of, you know, following this sort of who has a lobbyist at the Capitol. Um, 
idea of who stakeholders are here. My, my focus is trying to do good policy to try to do more um, to stop the spread of, of chronic wasting disease. And unfortunately, um, in you know, it hasn't gotten as much press because we've been dealing with our own human pandemic, but um, the increased cases and sort of bad actor uh, captive servid owners, you know, we have continued to be in the news. We continue to have that be an issue. And so um, I do think we need to do more. I think this is actually um, not that big of a change from current law. And again, the idea is to make sure that um, that hunters, uh, you know, we're talking about licensed hunters. So again, like the sort of this comment about other livestock, we don't have licensed wild cow hunting. We don't have licensed um, wild horse hunting, um, it's unique. And that's, that's why the, um, the language that we talk about and why this continues to be an issue, because this is a very unique situation where we have the same species on one side of the fence as the other side of the fence. Mm -hmm. And on one side of the fence, it's something that makes money for folks. And on the other side of the fence, it is a protected natural resource. And so I think that's, that's why, you know, we kind of have some unique, uh, you know, potential solutions to, to deal with this ongoing issue. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the follow-up. So Representative becker Finn, would it be safe to say that you didn't seek out any stakeholder input as you were putting this language together? Because that's what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Representative becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And first I want to clarify that the underlying bill is actually Chair Hansen's um, bill. I just want to clarify that. So I'm not the only one thinking about these things. There's several other people signed on to that bill as well. And no, I don't, I don't, um, this sort of this idea that like, um, only people designated as the stakeholders are the ones who get to weigh in. Um, have I talked to lots of other deer hunters about this issue? Yes, absolutely. Um, both on uh, hunter forums online with the folks that I know, both constituents, um, friends and family who hunt, um, actual people who deer hunt care a lot about this issue and I have talked to them. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, just a comment really. Um, just a few minutes ago, Representative Jamie Becker, you were talking about um, our responsibility during the uh, world pandemic and that we still have to do our job. And I think that we've all been around this uh, lawmaking uh, job long enough to hear oftentimes how important it is to engage all the stakeholders on an issue. And I myself have been uh, guilty of not doing that at times. And I feel like this is an example of where a, if we're going to get good policy and get good answers, we do need to hear from everybody, not just one side of the issue, the deer hunters, which I am a part of. My entire family is deer hunters, my kids included, my wife. Um, we're all deer hunters. We all have something at stake here. I think most of us, I'm saying uh, at the table, are deer hunters. Um, but on the other side of the coin, we also have people whose livelihoods are at stake. And at a time when people are losing their livelihoods, we're taking a very serious issue relevant to this industry because it is a business around the state. And we're creating a situation where vandals could literally break into a facility. As we heard earlier, 42 deer escaped due to vandals in 2019. And then immediately hunters could take up an opportunity to just shoot all those deer and no burden at all to try and recover the animals under this language. And so I would think that it would be part of our job and part of getting good policy passed uh, for us to do our due diligence. And I hear the bill or the provision author or authors saying that nobody uh, was sought out from the servant industry uh, to consult is to try to find some kind of a compromise, some kind of a solution, because you know that people are going to be adversely affected by this, no fault of their own. And I get the gravity of the issue. I think we've been talking about th the problems due to CWD for long enough that we all understand this is an important issue. It's dangerous, and uh, we need to be taking it very seriously, and I think we are. And I think that this is an attempt at doing that. But without getting input from everybody that is going to be affected, I just don't understand why it's being brought forward today. Members and 
Representative Fabian, I think you were next. I would ask if we actually have one of the stakeholders testify. He's been waiting patiently for about 45 minutes, and then that we proceed. And uh, Commissioner Meyer is still available for questions. Representative Heinzman, would that be okay? Mr. That would Quillis? be fine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Quillis. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, provide some testimony today, Mr. Chairman. I I'd like to start out by wearing my Minnesota Elk Breeders Association hat and point out a couple of things in the A7. As pointed out right now, under a current escape, you have 24 hours to notify the Department of Natural Resources. And also right now, language is in law and is being deleted that the DNR must allow the owner to attempt to capture the escaped animal. And that's being deleted, Mr. Chairman. So the notification changing from 24 to immediate and us not being allowed to recapture the animal, Mr. Chairman, is, is of concern. But also um, if one would escape, which very, I, I, would, I was questioning the number of hundreds of escapes, Mr. Chairman, I, and I think Dr. Glazer had, had confirmed that there are smaller than hundreds, but if one of them would escape during a uh, hunting season, those animals are worth thousands of dollars, at least for the folks I represent, the elk breeders. Those animals are worth thousands of dollars, and we would not be compensated if one of them would somehow get out and then be shot by a licensed hunter. We would at least like to be able to get the animal that would um, we would like to get back that we helped raise and spent money on. And like I said, they're worth thousands of dollars. And then finally, on that that first section, Mr. Chairman, where it talks about any escaped um, servant uh, killed by a hunter or by the commissioner must be tested, and then um, the test must be paid for at the owner's expense. We want to be involved in that testing. It's our animal. We need to know if there's CWD in it. The tests that we do are called IHC tests, immunohistorial chemistry tests, and they're known as the gold standard. And I'm not sure what the DNR uses. I think they might use what's known as the ELISA test. But we want to be involved in that testing process because we want to know if that animal had CWD in it, and we want to have input into that test. If we don't, the other thing that I'd like to point out, Mr. Chairman, it's at the owner's expense. And if there is a cost to us that involves us and whether the DNR says, here's what it costs in staff time, here's what it costs in transportation, here's what it costs in postage, and we'd like to challenge that, there's no process there that we would be able to challenge that invoice at the owner's expense. So those are just a couple of things I'd like to point out uh, in regards to that first section. In, term, in terms of the second section, uh, 2.3 down to 2.20, to be a part of the Minnesota Herd Certification Program, you have to be able to move animals. You have to have two ear tags, one state, one federal. And I just wanted to point out that those are checked visibly every year by the Board of Animal Health, along with a federal US uh, DA. And they're audited every three years to make sure that those books are checked and corrected. And it has been touched upon also about the GPS system. That technology that uh, my research that I've done is only available in collars. Mr. Chairman is not uh, available in tags. And the tags as pointed out by Dr. Glazer that are used by us are unique to that individual animal. If you wanted to call the Board of Animal Health or uh, the USDA or the local vet, they would be able to identify that animal immediately through those tag numbers because they are unique to that individual animal, Mr. Chairman. So I just wanted to point that out on those two sections. And I appreciate your time um, allowing me to comment on that. Mr. Chairman, while I'm here and then I can mute and, and go off, just can I change hats and do my Chamber of Commerce on two other sections of the bill? Uh, proceed, Mr. Quillis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the other ones that I'd like to point out, just a, a couple of questions are, uh, our House File 4433, as Representative Becker uh, Finn mentioned in their Representative Wagenius provisions, uh, dealing with groundwater, Mr. Chairman, and talks about a new standard for public hearings, dealing with a quarter million gallons per day in a 30-day period. We're just curious, Mr. Chairman, about the fiscal implication would be to the Department of Natural Resources on that. And then also, 
who would be affected by that? What industries? And, and my glance at just looking, unfortunately, my uh, statistics are sitting in the office, but my glance, if I remember correctly, at ground and surface water users, these public meetings would have to be held for any utility, city, food processing, paper mills, taconite plants, irrigators, and refineries, I think, are all the main users that would be cost that would be triggered into that, Mr. Chairman, in those public meetings. And in terms of, um, probably, I think I saw Mr. Meckel uh, on to ask uh, how many under the vintage groundwater um, provision, how many permits and um, watershed districts possibly would be affected by that. And then Mr. Chairman, on the final part of that, um, regarding the sustainability standard, the groundwater um, use must be sustainable the definitions that I've looked up under uh, sustainable, Mr. Chairman, would include uh, the aquifer being replenished. So the question there, I guess, to the agency or Representative Bukinius would be, what under sustainable um, do we need to have to draw out and that's not covered under the uh, sustainable definition up above in line 3.27, Mr. Chairman? And then finally, on the uh, food packaging and PFAS, I've had this test, I gave you this testimony in policy and, and finance, and the bill is currently sitting in the Health and Human Services Policy Committee. Uh, no other state in the nation has this regulation, Mr. Chairman. The PFAS in food packaging is heavily regulated by the federal government, and Maine and Washington has done something similar to this, but they have a number of alternatives in there, identifying safer alternatives, readily available, the product must be, comparable costs, must be only fiber-based products, and they have an extensive public engagement process, which lacks in this portion of the bill, Mr. Chairman. And then finally, I want to thank you for your time. The uh, effective date goes in uh, automatically on January 1st. There's no provision in there, what we call the manufacturer retail lag. And so uh, I just wanted to point that out, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate you allowing me to, uh, to state my opinions. Uh, and comments on the A7 amendment, and I'll stick around if there are uh, any comments or any questions I can answer. But thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to, uh, I want to get Representative Fabian in, and then I'll go to Representative Becker Finn to answer the specific questions. I assume we are still on CWD, Representative Fabian, or do, would you like to multitask on other issues as well? Um, well, I just became a grandpa again, too, so um, that's multi Thank you. I'm texting with my son. Um, anyway, um, on CWD, I have a question for maybe DNR or Board of Animal Health with regards to uh, the vandalism that Dr. Glazer talked about. I'm wondering about um, an investigation into that. Um, and if anybody has been charged and, and what the ramifications are of that investigation. Dr. Glazer. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representatives, I know that the producers, um, uh, for, for sure, for, the, for two of the situations, filed um, police reports, and so I know they were investigating that, but I'm not sure um, what the outcomes of those investigations were. So uh, maybe... Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I apologize. Uh, so maybe this is for uh, Colonel Smith. What would be um, uh, the penalty? What's the crime? What would be the charge if someone was found to be vandalizing property uh, in this case? Colonel Smith. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Fabian, this is the first I've heard of this vandalism. Um, I guess uh, it would be some type of damage to property. So depending on what they did with the vandalism, uh, you know, how much damage fiscally it was to the fence or the gate or however they damaged the property. And then um, it'd be probably up to the county attorney to decide um, if, if the animals were affected, the value of the animals and whatnot. So there could be um, some criminal charges could be, you know, depending on the dollar amount, it could be a misdemeanor, it could be a gross misdemeanor, it could be a felony, depending on how much um, fiscal damage was done to the facility. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my understanding and listening about what's going on in the servant industry, some of those animals are worth, you know, 10, 10, 20, 30,000 dollars. 
if there's, I believe, 42 animals that have escaped, it's pretty conceivable that there's uh, a few hundred thousand dollars in valuation there. If those animals are lost and killed, that could be a pretty serious penalty uh, for somebody who is involved in vandalizing, correct, Colonel? Colonel Smith. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Fabian, you're correct. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would that raise to a felony level, Colonel? Colonel Smith. Mr. Chair, it could depending, or Mr. Chair, Representative Fabian, it could depending on the dollar amount. So yes, it could easily get to a, a felony level. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my other question, and a lot of questions have been asked, um, what's the what's the fiscal impact of the CWD portion in the bill? I haven't seen a fiscal note that I remember on your bill, Mr. Chair. If there's something that I've missed, I apologize, but walk us through uh, the fiscal note or whatever, and then I need to hear from DNR. If there's not an appropriation, because to the best of my knowledge, we don't have a target yet, how are they gonna cover the expenses in this? Representative Becker Finn, I believe you have the fiscal note in front of you. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. So the, the fiscal note was sent out by the committee administrator and is posted on our house website. It, it has been available. Um, and, and just to clarify, that's where I got the, the approximately 100 animals per year is from the fiscal note. So I assume fiscal staff got that from one of our agencies. I'm not, you know, not sure exactly where that uh, came from, but that, that is what's in the fiscal note. Um, the other problem sort of with the fiscal note is that the fiscal note doesn't have the, um, doesn't include the, uh, the date that we have in this amendment. So the fiscal note is um, the original underlying language that was in House File 4331. Um, it does have uh, in Biennium 2021, it has a cost, but I think under our language, you'd be pushing that out. Um, and then the they have the a general fund 425 in 22 and in 23. Um, although I, I will say for the record that I question the accuracy of this based on the, the comments from the DNR already that this is basically what they're already doing. So I'm not sure exactly where that additional cost is coming from if it, this is already their practice. Commissioner Meyer to Representative Fabian's question. Mr. Chairman, members, if you look at the fiscal note, it's based upon the hours of activity required to deal with an escaped deer. So obviously, as Colonel Smith said, we weren't aware of those recent vandalism escapes, what occurred, what occurred there. But and Colonel Smith can can elaborate more on this. It in the fiscal note, it, it involves a team effort of officers and staff on the ground and other services such as air support to locate and destroy escaped servants. We assume 50 hours of conservation officer time per escaped incident. And then um, that's at $85 an hour. So again, it takes a lot of effort to deal with these things when they're escaped. It's as anybody knows in the field deer hunting, it's a, it's a labor time intensive endeavor. And uh, the fiscal note is based upon hours of activity on an average times the number of escaped deer. So. I think Representative Becker Finn was right on saying that um, it's kind of scalable depending on the number of deer we see. And right now, um, and Colonel Smith can, can chime in if, if we need to, these costs, unless they're covered out of the general fund appropriation we received last year, typically come from the licensed deer hunters, the, the game and fish fund that is out there right now. Representative Fabian. No, I'm good, Mr. Chair, thank you. Representative Green first, and then Representative Sandell. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I apologize for being a little late. Um, something with my internet kept me loading, but not coming on. But uh, I do have a question for the Department of Health. Um, with the, um, nearly half of the deer on those three incidents, can you tell me how many uh, of those deer were recaptured? Dr. Glazer. Uh, Mr. Chair and representatives, um, yes, let me go to my information. So um, I was just looking at, um, this was through state fiscal year 19. Um, we had um, in one case, um, there were 13 animals in one, 
incident and seven of those were recovered and six of those were killed. Um, in the other one, we had 14 animals escape. Um, no, let's see. We had three animals escaped and all three were returned. Um, in the other incident, there was um, 15 animals um, that escaped and 13 were returned and one was killed. So in all of those, we had just um, one animal that was lost. Okay. And so, uh, but then, uh, excuse, excuse me, Mr. Chair. So then six or seven then were, were killed because of this vandalism and uh, the, the owners of the farms then got no compensation for that, I assume, is that correct? Dr. Glazer. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative, that is my understanding there. I, there, we would not be able to um, compensate them. And so I don't believe anybody did, but that's not something that we track either. So I, you know, I, I can't think of anybody that would be there to compensate them. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Then the rest of my questions have probably been answered, but I do have a comment that this, this really is not workable from, from start to finish. I don't know of any other uh, area of law where we would take uh, someone's livelihood, uh, even uh, even if something happened that was no fault of their own, and say you have no chance to recoup any of this, to to take away the 24-hour period, and to just say once those animals hit that fence, even if a a storm comes by and drops a, a tree on them, or if someone cuts a cuts a fence open or cuts a uh, the lock off that fence, is just uh, it's almost unbelievable to me that that we would be passing a law that would uh, allow that and then just a quick note on the on page uh, two uh, on the identification tags uh representative lewick was right i mean you you would at, at 150 feet you'd have you, you're just not going to be able to read someone's uh name and address off that tag unless it was a huge tag now i realize that that probably the identification on that tag is not uh uh, would be used after the animal was down. However, in the law, the way that I'm reading this language, it says here, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you have to be able to read that from 50 yards away. Is that correct? Anybody? Representative Becker Finn, as the author of the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think um, Dr. Glazer had already answered that question earlier, but um, it's possible. Um, I certainly, I mean, the other thing with this is that we're talking about, about deer hunters here. And I, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that that piece is going to be a problem. And certainly, um, you know, we're going through the committee process. And if folks aren't happy with this language, you know, there will be opportunities to continue to 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 work on making sure that it, it's a workable option. But, um, you know, I, I think Dr. Glazer had already addressed that earlier. Representative Green. Mr. Chair, no, I don't think that she did, because that wasn't my question. Uh, as far as being able to, to see a tag, you can see a colored tag and you and if you know the, the identification of that color or maybe a number on that tag, then you personally could do that. What I'm saying is that according to this language, if I'm reading it properly, this says that when you tag that deer, whoever is looking at that deer has to be able to read that tag from 50 yards away. That's what it looks like it says to me. So if that's the case, this language on its face is just not workable. But that's that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Sandell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My questions refer to um, um, House File 4433. The um, committee brief said that um, uh, the uh, bill hadn't been heard before other committees and uh, would be discussed here. I wonder if um, you want to continue with the discussion on CWD or maybe come back to my questions later. Um, I would like to move on the questions. We have a half an hour left of time. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Wagenius, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the intent of the bill. And um, uh, I represent a suburban district with uh, uh, a great uh, number of uh, uh, development. And uh, am I still on here? Can you still hear me? Yes. Um, and I wonder uh, if if the bill was um, uh, written with the intention of, of um, either regulating or, or paying attention to uh, the the uh, the uh, 
uh, kind of rapid development which is occurring in in um, um, southeastern area of uh, our metro, uh, the southeast corner of our metro area, and I imagine others as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, let's uh, look at the basic here. Um, Minnesota law, like uh, the law in many other states, says that Minnesotans, all Minnesotans, are entitled to their fair share of groundwater. And that's their drinking water. And protecting drinking water is our state's number one priority. And DNR is charged with making sure that everybody gets their fair share. And we know that groundwater is under tremendous stress right now. And so what this language does uh, is give citizens a bit of oversight. And when you're, we're dealing with very high volumes of uh, taking groundwater, and it gives DNR some additional tools uh, to protect groundwater. So we need DNR to have all the tools necessary to do that. So basically what this uh, bill does is add a few tools to the toolbox uh, and allow us to assess where it's safe to pump very high volumes of groundwater and when and, when and where uh, using very high volumes of groundwater will either contaminate uh, groundwater or deplete local groundwater sources. Just the further further tools in the toolbox, and I can talk about individual tools if you'd like. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, uh, Representative Wiginius. I certainly support the bill. Appreciate you bringing it forward, and I uh, think it's really important. Thank you. Are there any other questions, Representative Becker Finn? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to have the discussion here. Um, I think the, the underlying bill is a good bill, and I think that these uh, provisions will make it better and uh, appreciate member support. Uh, I will also uh, note for the record that uh, I my name is uh, Representative Becker Finn. Um, I've served with many of you for four years now, um, but did want to make sure since that seemed to be uh, an issue on, on today's hearing. Representative uh I couldn't tell whether Representative Fabian or Representative Green went on first. Um, Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a question uh, on the amendment on starting on uh, 3.18. Uh, we're creating a whole new uh, definition of, for groundwater in here. And uh, I looked up a few things on, on tritium, but I'm wondering if the author of this portion of the amendment could explain to me uh, what tritium really is and, and, and where it comes from? Representative Wagenius. Thank you. Uh, tritium is, uh, I would guess, a, I could call a residue of atomic testing many, many years ago. And it was a one incident uh, thing, and it got into our uh, groundwater. It got every place, but into our groundwater. So it's very easy for scientists to measure how old, and generally when uh, groundwater is old, it's also clean. Uh, it's very easy, it's a very clear measurement of good groundwater. And so that's where uh, tritium comes from. That's why we call it vintage uh, big, instead of old, but that's just a choice of words. Um, so if you're testing for good groundwater, it's an easy test, it's about $50. And what was your other question? Oh, I, I know that we're making great changes. That's not true. Uh, if you look at on page uh, 3.24, we already have a sustainability standard in statute. And uh, this actually, just implements that further, it does not change the sustainability standard. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, some of the stuff that I did read, Representative Wagenius, is that tritium doesn't occur naturally, and it occurs when uh, 
ultraviolet light or sun rays, I guess, uh, it come in contact with nitrogen and it's, and it's in the air and there's a certain amount of it that uh, is, uh, occurs naturally. Uh, am I reading that right? Representative Wagini, yes. When I have talked to geologists about uh, tritium in groundwater, and that's what we're talking about right now, there is a measure, uh, I mean, there is an amount of tritium which is very small in groundwater that is old and older would be cleaner. And of course, we're trying to protect our clean groundwater. So toward the surface um, and you're getting rain, yes, you may have, I, there may be more tritium getting in and that is the issue here, is more surface water that is more polluted getting in to the deeper, cleaner groundwater. Representative Green. Well, thank you. But it, you know, it's kind of, you're kind of saying two different things, I think, because first you're telling me that the tritium only occurred one time years ago, but now you're saying more could be getting in. And so I'm wondering uh, which no. it is. No, there was this one, inc you. thank you, Mr. Chair. There was this one incident many, many years ago, and I think it was in the 50s, but somebody can correct me on that, um, where there was atomic fallout, and it, it shows up in our groundwater at a small amount when it is um, very deep, and it has been used by geologists for a long time as a measure of how old that water is. So newer water will have more tritium in it because it's closer to the surface. Dr. Green. Well, I'm not sure that that's really uh, core, uh, correlating with, with what I'm seeing here, but uh, as long as we're uh, continue to go down the uh, list here. If you go down a little further on that, and this could be uh, for the author or whoever put this part in, but it, it talks about uh, when determining whether uh, consumptive use of groundwater is sustainable, the commissioner must make determination at the level of recharge of the aquifer. And basically it goes to how it's going to impact the, uh, and meet the future needs of, needs of future generations. Uh, can the DNR tell me how they do that? How, how are they going to look into the future and see what the needs of future generations are? Representative Green, are it, you asking for the DNR to answer? Yeah, I'll ask for the DNR. Mr. Meckel, and if you could uh, announce yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jason Meckel, I'm the section manager of the Department of Natural Resources. Um, I'm not turning my video on because I'm We don't have the video, but we don't have the audio, Mr. Meckel. From East Metro uh, for the area around Bonanza Valley. We've developed them around Little Rock Creek and Cold Spring. And essentially what we're talking about here Mr. is- Mr. Chair, can you ask him to start over his answer, please? Yes, Mr. Meckel, uh, we were unable to hear the entirety of that. If you could- Okay, start I'm over, sorry. Mr. Mr. Chair, I'm having internet issues, I apologize. <clears throat> um, we use groundwater models to determine um, the amount of recharge. It's essentially developing a water balance for a given geography of the state. And we're doing that in places where we're experiencing some of the greatest use of groundwater, uh, parts of the Twin Cities and some of our agricultural areas around the state. Representative Green. Well, you're telling me how you're how you're gauging it now, but it says here you're going to have to determine the needs of future generations, and I'm wondering what you have in place to uh, to look into the future and, and determine that. Mr. Meckel. Okay. Mr. Chair, Representative Green. Um, in the case of the the Twin Cities area, what we are using is uh, population growth projections for the communities. So we um, project forward what they anticipate 
the volume of water will be needed. And we do that as far as uh, the uh, plans uh, for population growth goal, which is about 2040, uh, to some extent, maybe 2050. Um, but in the rest of the state, um, you know, what we have to go on is what's the current level of use and whether or not there's anticipated future increases, but we, as you're indicating, don't have a crystal ball about exactly what that will be. Representative Green, I believe uh, Representative Wagenius as the author of that section um, would like to answer. Okay, uh, Representative Green, if you'd look on line 3.27, current law actually says that uh, the commissioner must determine that groundwater use is, sus is sustainable to supply the needs of future generations. That's current law. What we're adding here is a definite, uh, a more clear definition of what sustainable is, and that is to make sure that there is a recharge available. Representative Green. Well, we could get into long discussions on that, but I know we're going to run out of time. But um, the recharge on the aquifers is comes from. Uh, from rain for the most part, so or for all from all parts, I guess. So I don't know how you're going to be able to do that unless you can predict the weather uh, years to come. Um, and there's there's other issues here too, uh, Mr. Chair. And I hate to keep jumping around, but uh, we uh, uh, on the on the PFAS for food packaging that is in here. Now we did hear this in policy committee, and uh, it was really really not ready for prime time. Uh, if, if this goes in this bill, uh, from talking to the manufacturers that I have, this could potentially uh, empty the shelves faster than COVID-19. Uh, so the, the wording in the, in the language for the PFAS is, uh, is also very unworkable. But I think that the, this whole amendment, to take the, um, the bill that you had, which was basically, uh, non controversial for the most part, and add this to it's going to be very troublesome. So thank you. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just real quickly, um, I'm concerned about the provisions in the bill that Representative Waginius was just talking about. Um, when you require a public meeting for large water users, um, I'm curious if someone, DNR or whatever, can tell me um, if it's, who are the large water users? Obviously municipalities, um, some of our utilities possibly, uh, the mining industry, uh, the paper industry, um, over here, the sugar beet industry and so forth. Can you tell me how is this public meeting process going to work and, and how are you going to cover the costs and what would be the format for a public meeting? Okay, well, let me start with that. You have listed um, some of the people who use high volumes of water, but remember, uh, all, all Minnesotans uh, have a fair share under our law, uh, have a fair share of the water. So if some very, we're talking about extremely high volumes, a quarter of a million gallons per day on average. So this gives the um, public who also uses the same groundwater an opportunity uh, to weigh in. Um, citizens should be able to gather and share information. And this, is, this actually goes right back to our basic constitution of the right of assembly. So uh, it's, it's a fairness part of the bill. I'm trying to achieve some balance, even though we're using very, very high volumes of water uh, to trigger uh, that balance. Representative Fabian, if you could close. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just curious to know how is uh, DNR is in charge of this? How is DNR going to manage this? To and Representative Wagini has talked about this being some tools for the DNR. I'm curious to know if the DNR wants these tools and can they manage these tools? Commissioner Meyer, quickly. 
Mr. Chairman, members, I do not have a list of the amount of public meetings that this will entail. Maybe Mr. Meckle can provide that to us, but uh, the cost of these public meetings is going to be something we will have to address and, and the testing as well. I'm not sure if $50 per test is the right number or not, but um, we can address those as this bill moves forward into ways and means with the fiscal note on the bill if we need to. Representative Beckerfin renews the A7 motion. Uh, Mr. Schwartzwelder, would you please take the roll? Clay, if you could take the roll, please. Yep. Hanson. Yes. Claflin. Yes. Fabian. No. Backer. Votes no. Becker Backer Finn. votes no. Yep. Backer votes no. Becker Finn. Yes. Eklund. Yes. Fisher. Yes. Green. No. Heinzman. Heinzman votes no. Heinzman votes no. Lee. Lee votes aye. Lewick. No. Morrison. Yes. Nelson. No. Purcell. Aye. Sandell. Aye. Sundin. Aye. Tice. No. Wodinius. Yes. 11 ayes, 7 nays. You need to, you need to unmute, Rick. Uh, the A7 amendment is passed. Moving to Representative Becker Finn to move the A4 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, this this is the lands bill. Uh, there are no changes from uh, the previous version of the lands bill. Um, would appreciate member support. I know that uh, Representative Fabian has another amendment here. So I uh, will refer members to look at the documents uh, sent out by the CA. Uh, happy to take quick questions, but I, I do want to make sure we get our work done today. Members, are there any questions? Representative Becker Finn renews her motion for the A4 amendment. Clay, could you take the roll? Hanson. Aye. Clarkland. Aye. Fabian. Aye. Backer. Aye. Becker Finn. Aye. Eklund. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Green. Aye. Heinzman. Heinzman. Lee. Lee votes aye. Lewick. Aye. Morrison. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Purcell. Aye. Sandell. Aye. Sundin. Aye. Tice. Aye. Wodinius. Aye. Heinzman. Aye. 18 ayes, zero nays. The A4 amendment is adopted. Representative Fabian. Representative Fabian, you're muted. If you could unmute, please. I'm unmuted. Thank you. I'm just uh, so excited. I've been looking at pictures of my new grandson. So, um, uh, House uh, the A6 amendment is my uh, amendment. What it does is it removes the sunset that was uh, established on a pilot project here in Northwest Minnesota that allowed the uh, uh, leaving of portable deer stands, you know, ladder stands, climbing stand 
hang on stand ground blinds to be left on a WMA uh, during the deer hunting season, uh, provided that you leave your name on it along with the DNR identification number and your address. It's more restrictive than it is on other public lands, uh, state forest lands. It's something that's been very, very widely accepted up here. It's gotten a lot of really positive comments. I've talked to DNR about it, uh, both uh, regionally and the state. And uh, it's something that uh, I think is really a, a good policy. And uh, I hope that we can continue it. I've talked to a number of members about this and I appreciate your support. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just wanted, uh, for the record, um, I did talk to Representative Fabian about the amendment ahead of time um, and do uh, just want to clarify for the record that uh, the northwest region of the state, the WMAs, there are very large. And so it's kind of a unique situation. And um, I don't think it's the author's intent, but I certainly wouldn't be my intent that this is kind of a... Um, slippery slope to opening up other areas of the state for, for this, this way of, of regulating deer stands. But I, it's my understanding that this is unique to the Northwestern region of the state. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I plan to support the amendment uh, if that, if the author could clarify that piece. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, this was a pilot project. If you uh, know where the Red River is, you come east on Highway 1, which goes uh, through Thief River Falls to the east to over uh, just about to, about to Beltrami County slightly, then north up through War Road to the Canadian border. So it's mainly Roseau, Kitson, Marshall, a little bit of Pennington and a little bit of uh, Beltrami County. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, nothing further, Mr. Chair. Uh, I support the amendment. Clay, could you take uh, the roll? Hanson. Aye. Clacklin. Aye. Fabian. Aye. Acker. Aye. Becker Finn. Aye. Eckland. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Green. Aye. Heinzman. Aye. Lee. Lee votes aye. Lewick. Aye. Morrison. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Purcell. Aye. Sandell. Aye. Sundin. Aye. Tice. Aye. Oginius. Aye. 18 ayes, zero nays. The A6 amendment is adopted. We will now proceed to the bill as amended. Is there any discussion? I will renew my motion that House File 3657, as amended, be recommended to be re referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. The clerk will take the roll. Sorry, one sec. All right. Hanson. Aye. Clapman. Claflin. Voting on the bill. Aye. Aye. Fabian. Aye. Fabian, no. Backer. Backer, no. Becker Finn. Aye. Eckland. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Green. No. Heinzman. No. Lee. Lee votes aye. Lewick. No. Morrison. Aye. Nelson. No. Purcell. Aye. Sandell. Sandell. I got it. Sandell votes aye. Sundin. Aye. Tice. No. Wodinius. Aye. 11 ayes, 7 nays. Motion is adopted. Members, I'd like to thank you for uh, your participation. I think this was a good hearing. 
I don't know if we're going to have future hearings. Um, we are obviously in an unprecedented and unique time, but I want to thank you for your professionalism and participation. We are adjourned.